Welcome to Manifold. Today's episode is a co-release with a new UK podcast called Seeking Truth from Facts. Seeking Truth from Facts will focus on geostrategy, international relations, the decline of the US empire, and related issues. We have a very interesting conversation, and I think you'll enjoy this episode. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a fantastic podcast lined up with Steve Shu. We've got a lot of things to discuss, mainly focusing on geopolitics, including Russia, China, and a lot of issues relating to geopolitics. So if you could introduce yourself, Steve. Uh, Alf, it's great to be on your podcast. My name is Steve Shu. People probably know me as a professor of theoretical physics and a guy who, who also does research in things like AI and computational genomics and has founded a few deep tech yeah. companies around these technologies. Perfect. And you've also, in, especially in recent times, you've commented a fair amount on geopolitical matters, particularly as it relates to China. Yeah. So I have a fair bit of expertise about China because I have been traveling there for some time for scientific and business collaborations. So okay. I understand the science and technology ecosystem there. I have a long background in defense and intelligence related stuff, which is okay. uh, not entirely public, but <laughs> uh, some of it is. The okay. CI Venture Fund was an investor in my first startup, which is an encryption right. startup. And we developed te technologies to defeat the firewall which right. was being built in the early 2000s in China. So, so I have a fair bit of expertise about this stuff, but it's not, I'm not broadly known for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess one of my first, one of the first things I wanted to discuss concerns something which I saw you comment on recently and uh, your, your comments on it got gained, gained some traction on, on Twitter X, some prominent people were retweeting it and reposting your clips of you talking about it, which is where you discussed the failure of U.S. chip sanctions on China. And I also remember what Kishore Mabubani went on your podcast, Manifold, and he, and in both, in both these instances, you discussed the U.S.'s shift away from free trade and more towards a kind of geostrategically oriented protectionism. And obviously this came after more than a quarter century of the U.S. positioning itself as the global champion of free trade and globalization with the overwhelming consensus among economists, both then and now, the free trade was more beneficial to economic well-being. So what is it particularly about the U.S. and the U.S.'s reaction to China's rise, which prompted this dramatic shift? Yeah, so I, I could give uh, more than one theory of this case for completeness. So, so the cynical view is that you know, when the U.S. was the completely dominant hegemon, mm. you know, in the wake of World War II, it was the only advanced economy that hadn't been devastated by the war. Yeah. In, in the, under those circumstances, the U.S. wanted free trade. They wanted to set up a system for world trade and finance, which they could dominate. Once a challenger arose that could really compete <laughs> well with them, they sort of switched gears and have moved to, you know, a system where... They're willing to violate free trade agreements. So for example, yeah. they've totally mobilized the, the WTO. I don't think most people realize that, but the U.S. Yeah. has more or less deliberately frozen the WTO from action on trade matters. Yeah. So, so that's the cynical view, which is just great powers do what is mm -hmm. in their best interest. And now it's in the best interest of the U.S. or at least the hawkish people in Washington would say this to you know limit China's rise as much as possible. And they even say this, they even... I think most of the U.S. government would say this explicitly, that they're actually yeah. trying to contain China. So that's, that's, the, the, realist, that's the realist view, I guess. Yeah, that's the realist view. I think the U.S. apologist statement would be, oh, these Chinese don't play fair because they, <laughs> you know, they, there's a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a sort of mixed state-led slash free market economy in China. Yeah. And so there's a lot of government investment in 
capacity and in developing companies. And so it's not fair for Western companies to have to compete against that system. And plus their military technology is getting better and better. So we just, we, we, we're just, we're just behaving as enlightened people, but as enlightened people that have to protect us. Yeah. Which of those perspectives do you think more aligns with, with reality based on what <laughs> I think it's, I, well, I lean more toward the former than the latter. Yeah. But, you know, I think there, uh, no system is completely monolithic. Uh, no. You know, Stalin's government wasn't monolithic. Mao's no. government wasn't monolithic. Yeah. And the U.S. system is. Definitely. So there are plenty of Americans who lean more toward the who, you know, really, and I guess maybe I put myself in that, in that group. I, I would say that. Probably we're not going to be able to contain China short of a World War III, which would be, you know, just devastating for both countries or yeah. the whole world. And given that the best outcome is to be realistic and say they are going to have more influence geopolitically and they are going to capture more market shares, more market yeah. share globally. But that doesn't mean the U.S. can't remain extremely prosperous and exactly and yeah, yeah. trade. So, so, but, but of course, like there's this thing called the Thucydides trap where the rising power, the, the existing hegemon always reacts, sort of overreacts yeah. versus the rising power and it, you end up in a, in a hot war or something like that. And we do seem to be trending in that direction. Yeah, I guess it's a sort of zero sum fallacy that arises that, oh, if China's doing yes. well, it must be at the expense of America. Yeah. A lot of this comes from, you know, it sounds very trite to say it this way, but a lot of it really does result from, well, we could say even actually racism or mm -hmm. even, or maybe more mildly just sort of ignorance about the other. Yeah. And so it's very easy for American politicians, whether you're on the left or the right, to yeah. conjure up the worst case scenario in a world where China, say, surpasses the U.S. in economic or military power. And, and so... We would just naturally assume as Americans who don't know that much about China that, oh, it's going to be the worst possible thing, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so they're going to try to ensla enslave us and, you know, whatever. And, you know, I, I think in defense of hawkish war planners, that's their job. Like some of them, their job is to imagine the worst case scenario yeah. and then sound the alarm that, hey, there's now some significant tail risk of this worst case scenario arising and I need to make you aware of that. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. That's very reasonable. But when the system tilts a little bit too much yeah. in that direction, then, then you can have a real problem. And I guess the difference is, is a, a, bit, a big difference comes when the media starts really beating the drum of they're coming, they're coming, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, well, I think if you, if you watch carefully Western media, because of concentration of, of power, mark, you know, market power and yeah. control over the media, the, the, the sort of corporate mainstream media and also state controlled media like, you know, BBC or PBS mm -hmm. or Deutsche, yeah. Deutsche Welt in Germany, they're all singing from the same playbook. And it's, it's very easy to get them stampeded on, you know, what later turns out to be nonsense. Like if Definitely. you actually look at what they, if you look at what they wrote about the 2016 election and things like Russian interference and yeah, you know, yeah. like whether Trump was actually spied upon by the U.S. intelligence services, everything the main, the corporate media wrote about that, if, if you look carefully, looking backwards in time, you can see they were just totally wrong about everything they said. But, yeah, and but it, almost it, all, the, all the elites more or less accepted uh, what they were saying. So. Yeah, and it was, we had a similar thing here in Britain, I'm sure you know, to do with Brexit and in 2016 as well, and to do with, I know Dominic Cummings was a big, target of that with Carol Cadwallader, I think. Um, yeah. Mostly. If you, if you, if your listeners are predominantly in the UK, I'll, I'll give them a treat and say that, you know, Dom and I have been close friends for, I don't know, 15 years, something like All that. Right. And, and so I, I know very well about yeah, I'm sure. how Dom, Dom literally broke Carolyn Codwaller's brain. Yeah. And she's never been the same since. Yeah. And everything she wrote and that The Guardian wrote and other papers wrote about yeah. the Vote Leave campaign and the role of Cambridge Analytica and stuff like that is, is all wrong. It's completely it's just wrong. Fair. It's I just made know. up. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, then, it's made up. And I actually, I actually know the guys 
who yeah. did the data science work for Dom, and I know what they did. And it's it's it wasn't Cambridge Analytica, and it wasn't right. anything like what Cadwallader imagines. But and that stands in the minds of most Britons. Yeah, and then she brought in like all this theory about Steve Bannon being involved and Russia being involved. <laughs> Yeah, uh, believe me, Dom Dom doesn't really know Steve Bannon at all, and certainly right. never was influenced by Steve yeah. Bannon. Yeah, yeah. I suppose another, like, um, returning to China, another thing uh, we've been hearing a lot about recently is that China is apparently in the midst of some like really deep economic crisis. That's something that we're hearing being shouted from the roof. Yes, from corporate media. Yeah, I. To to go deeper into that subject, I recommend a podcast that I just released within the last couple of weeks called China Myths and Realities. Oh, perfect. I think maybe, yeah, it's maybe episode 65 of Manifold. And I'm talking to a guy who was a tech founder and ran his company in Beijing for seven years at odds. And we're talking about these issues, these topics. And, and, and in fact, the chip war thing that you were discussing is an excerpt from that okay. episode. So, so we, so listeners might be interested to go. Brilliant. I'll, yeah, I'll definitely, uh, I definitely say um, go check that out. The, yeah. way I would, the way I would characterize the current economic situation in China is that they had a monstrous property bubble, probably the biggest yeah. property bubble of all time. Yeah. And so people for the last more than a decade have been commenting that the Chinese government is going to have to act to pop this property bubble. Mm. Basically what happened there is that, you know, they, they went from a very poor country to you know, a very developed country in about 30 years. Yeah. But, you know, the stock market there is not as developed as the yeah. United States. Yeah. And the, the number of ways that people can invest their money is relatively limited there. It, it, at this moment in time, it's no longer limited. But over time, it, you know, say 10 years ago, 15, Definitely, 20 yeah. years ago, basically everybody who had excess money to invest was investing it in real estate, in property. And so yeah. you had this crazy bubble where apartments were just completely unaffordable in mm. China and especially in the tier one cities. And so what yeah. happened is that the government basically just said, we, we don't want our economic growth to be built on real estate speculation and right. yeah. just developing, building more buildings and stuff. And, and of course, some of that infrastructure was necessary because as I said, it was a very poor country mm. and it needed to build all that infrastructure. So a lot of it was necessary. And, and some people would even argue that over time, you'll see that the stuff built during this bubble will get used. Yeah. But it's a little, it's a little uncertain exactly how much inefficiency there or waste there was in the bubble. But in any case, the government acted to pop that bubble in the last few years. And so what's happened is, you know, if you remember the 2008, yeah, your listeners are old enough. If you remember what happened when the U.S. real estate bubble popped, it, it crippled the U.S. economy. Yeah, for, of course. Of you know, course. really the years. And took, yeah, the world, and it, and took what, most of the world with it. Yeah. Yeah. And if it weren't for huge amounts of quantitative easing, which China isn't actually doing, we would have been in an even worse situation. So, so you have to, anybody who wants to analyze something as complicated as like the rise of China has to be able to maintain multiple factors. In yeah. So one factor is yes, indeed, they have, they have this headwind against economic growth because of their having popped this property bubble and the economy is sort of adapting to this. And Xi Jinping's, you know, very explicitly stated planning in the, you know, the government is they are going to de-emphasize that kind of infrastructure investment yes. because they've already gotten enough of it. And they're going to focus on what they call high quality growth, which means, you know, R&D, yeah. advanced manufacturing, you know, moving up the value chain in manufacturing, yeah. AI, stuff like that. So, so they're, they have very explicit plans to do that. But of course, in the interim, which could easily last a few years or five years, um, you're going to be able to easily find examples of young people who are discouraged. With, they can't find the job that they want. People that are out of work, construction workers, you know, there are all kinds of negative consequences. You know, so it's really a structural bubble, shift right? is, is what we're seeing in China. Yeah, yeah. So, so one factor is, Yes, one factor is they're in the middle of a structural shift. Another factor, though, is that they've more or less closed almost all technological gaps with the rest of the world. Right. So you can almost not find a vertical where, you know, in that particular technology or manufacturing capability, China 
applied. Like, like say advanced machine tools for a while, like the Germans were still ahead of the Chinese, but I think that gap is gone now, right? Or electric vehicles or, or cars. They're not yeah. the number one exporter of cars. It's surpassing Japan. So for people that are carefully studying all the factors of economic development, it seems like actually they're in pretty strong position. Like you, in other yeah. words, you would ignore them yes, at your yeah. peril. Like their ship, right. shipbuilding industry dwarfs the Korean ship building industry, which yeah. then dwarfs like the rest of the world's ship building Definitely. industry, right? And so if you're going to fight a naval war with them, you better think about that ahead of time. And I, I guess uh, another thing people the, the people should really focus on is, as you said, the comparison between the way that China has handled its speculative real estate bubble and the way that both America handled its in the 2000s and how the Japanese government, for instance, handled theirs in the 80s. Exactly. It's a much yeah. more proactive approach where they don't let the bubble get too big to fail. They step yeah. in it, the pulpit. In, the fact, if, in fact, if you, if you look at research by academic economists, there's kind of a lively debate. I mean, I mean, you know, the people that are kind of far right pro-market people wouldn't agree with this, but among many economists, there's this question of should central banks have bubbles? Mm. And this was asked during the real estate bubble. It was asked during the tech bubble. And so the question is like, if you're the central bank and you suspect like there is a bubble brewing in the stock market, should you like raise interest rates to pop the bubble? And, you know, so like it, it's actually something even in quote free countries like the United States or yeah, England. Yeah. You know, academics debate whether the government should do stuff like this. Now, in China, where the state is stronger, it's a more autocratic system for sure. Yeah, the government's going to occasionally just move, just say, like, okay, this industry, coal plants, we're done with that. Everything is going to be solar now. Right? So, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that, you know, they could make huge mistakes, huge blunders, but they could also, like, move, you know, they can also traverse valleys where, you know, market system going to have trouble, like making this like big shift. Because incentives maybe are wrong locally, although like in a global sense, we definitely know we have to switch to these renewable energies, but the local incentives are kind of wrong, but the government, if it's powerful enough, can just basically force the whole system to pivot. Yeah, and I and guess the some, Chinese are willing, willing to do stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And right. I guess some, some of the more free market types might say that that's central planning, but I would argue maybe not because they're doing it based on market signals, right? That's their source of information. Yeah. I think if you, if you, again, if you carefully study how the Chinese system works, number one, it is still predominantly a free market system. Yeah. So in other words, like whatever it is the government's trying to do, solar panels or semiconductors, the actual people executing on the plan are people who are incentivized by things like stock options. Okay. Yeah, and, yeah, so, yeah. and so, so as the, at the grassroots level where stuff is really being done, the businesses are being built, there are, there are people system. are, yeah. Yeah, it's a market system. I was just in, in Frankfurt for a meeting of oligarchs. And, you know, one of the oligarchs said to me, hey, who is German and, a, and a, a former physicist, he said, you know, in Germany for the first time now, we've surpassed, we have more government workers than free market. In other words, right. 50 percent of all people employed in Germany are employed by the government. Right. OK. And, and he was he was decrying this as like really terrible uh, and that Germany is finished because of stuff like this. And it's like he might be right, but I don't think China is at that point. I think China is no. actually more free market by that measure than yeah. in Germany, for example. So, yeah. yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you about is there's this chart that I've been seeing float around and I've seen people like Noah Smith post it. It's yep. basically China's nominal GDP as a percentage of America's. And it, yes. it appears to show that since around 2021, China has been shrinking for the first time since the economic miracle began in the 80s. Yeah. I mean, yep. Does, yep. This does this chart show, as has been claimed, that China is now on track to remain stuck behind the US, that China's model's failing, or that the Trump and Biden administration's protectionist policies have been effective? And if not, what's well, the, the truth behind it? Right. So, so at, at the root question here is, how do you compare... Yeah. two economies, which could be qualitatively different. How do you compare them in terms of size and quality, right? And in this case, maybe they're more focused on size. And the, the, 
the question of like, well, how do I monitor activity in country one and compare it to activity in country two? And then what's the unit of measurement that I use to convert? Yeah. And if you, and if you use nominal exchange rates, I mean, on the same day, Noah, who <laughs> might know pretty well, yeah. like he might say, yeah, look at this graph, China's finished. And then like later in the day, he might say something like, yeah, they're definitely managing their exchange rate and underpricing the RMB because they want to keep their exports strong, right? Yeah. So, so he could utter the same two. But th what do those two sentences mean? It means that maybe the, no maybe the nominal exchange rate is off by 20%. Exactly. The economy actually 20 if, you, if you're measuring by normal, larger, yeah. the no statistic of nominal yeah. GDP is very vulnerable to, to changing exchange rates. Yeah. So I think a more like reasonable, like, so, so, you know, kind of ill-defined question, like whose economy is bigger, right? Yeah. Because in, in no way were you ever going to like literally sell everything in one economy to the other economy, right? So, so the, the marginal exchange rate is not necessarily the right conversion factor. And I guess, let me make two points. This is getting a little bit in the weeds of econometrics, but number one, the way that both governments report GDP in their own currencies is radically different. So the way US yeah. accounts for services, there's something called owner imputed rent. Something like, yeah. th th there's, there's stuff like, oh, the property of my house in the United States, if I chose to rent it out, you know, what that would be a contribution to GDP. Th there's all kinds of things which the Americans do that the Chinese don't do in their actual GDP statistics. So, so first of all, you have to be careful about that. And then the, the second point is that if you just look at like actual non, you know, things that cannot be distorted, like actual physical quantities that, you know, characterize the two economies, like, oh, how much electricity is being produced to consume? How many tons of steel? You know, when you look at stuff like that, the Chinese economy is qualitatively larger than the US economy. It's almost like two acts. Definitely. Like, yeah. But any, yeah. Like, yeah. So, so it's like, which one do you like better? Like yeah. for services, McKinsey? you know, consultants and, and realtors who get 5% of every transaction in the U.S. or 6% of every transaction. So, so is that actually make the quote, economy of the U.S. bigger and stronger than that of China? Or, you know, literally like, are we going to be more worried about who can produce more ammunition and planes and tanks or, or even like more advanced manufactured goods that the rest of the world wants, right? So I think you just have to be very careful in comparing what's Definitely. going on here. And another thing I wanted to to mention was that just to stay on on the topic of of China's economy is that China, as you mentioned earlier, has in recent years emerged as potentially the world leader in high tech manufacturing. What specific government industrial policies have been implemented to affect this, and have they been successful? And if they have been successful, what way in which in what way were they done, which made them successful and, and made China yep. the world leader? Yep. So, so there was a, a thing which really, you know, set the alarm bells ringing in Washington. And it was, it was a policy a document from China called, I think, China 2025. Right. I, I made it China um, 2025, was it? Yeah. And that yeah. was a set of basically directives. The way the government works there is the central government. It is actually even the government aspect. I'm not talking about the free market aspect. The government aspect in China is very decentralized. So. Right. It, it's not, it's not that every dollar flows through like the, the treasury or something like that. What actually yeah, yeah. happens is that the central government sets policy and direction. The individuals who are the mayor of a city of 20 million people or the governor of a province of 100 million people, i.e. larger than Germany, you know, those people are, are vying to advance in the political system. So they are trying to follow the directives that are issued by the central government but they have a lot of latitude in how they do it. So if in the city of Shenzhen, they say, hey, we, we understand what China, made in China 2025 is really focused on, you know, we need to improve the quality of our jet engines. We're, okay. gonna, we're, gonna, lure, we're gonna lure some R&D center to Shenzhen by giving them free land and building them a building and, and apartments for the researchers. And we're basically gonna subsidize that particular goal in the, the central government's plan, but we're going to do it based on our own local strategy. The, the mayor or the governor of that region will then like point to that years later and say, yes, and we're the ones, it's our company, Shen Yang Aeronautical Industries that built the first competitive, you know, high bypass jet engine now that brings okay. us clarity with the West, 
right? And that that guy will get promoted based on that. But it's a decentralized system. It's almost yeah. like a venture capital system where individual regional political bosses are making bets and they're subsidizing industries locally to make those bets. And if they win, if DJI, which is located in Shenzhen, becomes by far the dominant drone manufacturer in the world, the, the guy who subsidized <laughs> DJI gets, was actually- Gets promoted, he, right. Yeah, DJI was actually a spin out of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Okay. Was, you know, different region than, than Shenzhen. But Shenzhen makes it really, really attractive for companies like that to relocate there. So I'm sure whoever was in charge of luring DJI there and helping them grow is whenever he's in Beijing pimping, DJI is like <laughs> a huge success of, of Shenzhen. This is how the, their political system works. It's, it's totally different from the caricature people here yeah. have of like, no, it's like, it's like guys in Mao suits and Joseph Stalin and they're nervous that and they say the, the wrong like thing. Like a golf plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they think it's like, oh, so they say the wrong thing, then she hits a red button and then some guy, yeah, that, you know, yeah. his, his chair yeah. falls into the piranha, piranha pool or something. It's not <laughs> like that at all. It's, it's like local guys have their budgets. Yeah. They're trying to generally conform with what they think the bosses above want, but they have a lot of latitude in how they, which particular things they invest in. Now, the downside of this is that they have there, there are more EV companies because many different regional governments decided to basically try to subsidize or, or you know, produce EV car makers in their regions. And so there's, oh, there is overcapacity. There's going to be a dog eat dog, you know, consolidation where maybe half the different EV companies in China are going to go out of business and the winners are going to take over their manufacturing capabilities. So, so it does lead to that kind of, you could call it waste. It, but it is a kind of Darwinian, Darwinian competition also. Yeah, and I guess, and it's true, I think I, I've read that the subsidies that are given to strategic industries in China are different from in some of the Western countries where it's almost, it's pretty much corporate welfare. Yeah. Whereas in China, I know they're very much conditional based on certain targets. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you still could have a situation where the governor of some Northeastern province where, you know, coal mining is still a big deal for them, doesn't want his unemployment numbers to go through the roof. And so he might be subsidizing some money losing, you know, old economy industries or coal mining companies, you know, there is a decline like approach, that. I guess. Yeah. But yeah. which, which, you know, a lot of people who are a little bit left of center, you know, in the U.S. or Scandinavia, would say like, "Well, this is totally reasonable, right?" Yeah, and stuff. But, but, yeah. but, but the the I think the most productive stuff, the most kind of like really impactful stuff, is what you said. Is is like they basically will they if they're told quantum computing, you know, the government said, "Hey, quantum computing is one of our priority efforts, semiconductor manufacturing." The local guy is going to be like, "Oh shit, let me talk to all the venture capitalists in my city and all <laughs> the professors and all this." And let's see if we can put together something in Chongqing that can be competitive in the semiconductor space. And they'll run their own local, they'll have the equivalent of like McKinsey type people running their own local study of, okay, which part should we bet on? Should we bet on the wafer production part? Should we bet on the lithography part? Should we bet on the, you know, quality control technologies or, you know, design software? They'll try to figure out where they have strengths from their universities and their existing companies and, and, and such, and then they'll invest, right? So, so th that's actually how it works. Right, okay. And I know just to mo moving on to a discussion of China's political system, I know you've been a critic of the, and we've, we've, we discussed, we've discussed it j earlier just now, a critic of the common Western characterization of China as just like a dictatorship. Yes. And obviously it's more, probably more accurate to describe it as a political meritocracy. I mean, so, what... so I, I would say it, it is, it has very merit. It, so this is, and this is a deep cultural thing in China. So, so yeah. the idea that state officials are supposed to be meritorious people. So they're supposed to be people who succeeded on the imperial exams. And mm -hmm. not only that, in Confucianism, public officials are supposed to model behavior for the rest of the, so there's a very like tight, like kind of street jacket on the way leaders are in traditional Chinese culture, the way leaders are supposed to behave. You're, you're not supposed to be a flamboyant playboy like JFK. That doesn't, isn't the way Confucian culture actually teaches you 
you know, that leaders in your society should behave, right? So, so there's this old cultural component, which is thousands of years old of Confucianism, which values meritocracy and, and it has very prescribed even rituals for how leaders are supposed to behave vis-a-vis okay. the common people. So that's one piece of it. Now, it is true that it is more autocratic because it, it does have still a- many aspects which are really communist, you know, leftover from, you know, Leninist, communist, yeah. you know, systems. And yeah, so that she does have much more power, you know, personally than mm-hmm. any one Western leader, right, in their country. So, so it, has, it has lots of differences from yeah. the Western system, some of which, you know, I, I think are good and some of which I think are bad. Yeah. Um, I don't particularly like the autocratic nature of the system, but it is what it is. And I, you know, it does let them do things sometimes that if, if she has the right idea, he can, he can yeah. do things very far in the right direction. If he has the wrong idea, he can move things very far in the wrong direction. But I obviously, it's, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not autocratic in the way somewhere like Turkmenistan is. No, I think it's very different from any of those countries. And it, it may actually be compared, this is again, things that most Westerners don't understand, is that all of the successful Asian tigers, yeah. like Korea or Taiwan, even Singapore. Japan, Singapore, went through an autocratic strongman stage of development yeah. before they became democracies. All of most of these countries like Korea and Taiwan, for example, have only been mm-hmm. democracies for a very short amount of yeah. time within my living memory. Definitely. So yeah. before that, before that, they had a kind of autocratic system. No, in, in South Korea, it was Park Chung-hee and Chun de Kwan, wasn't it? Whatever. Yeah, exactly. And, the, and, and man, if yeah. you look into like, if you look into the stuff they did, it was pretty nasty, right? Yeah, they yeah. Down labor unions and do all kinds of stuff, right? And and in, in Taiwan, when the KMT took over the country, they killed a lot of the local Taiwanese they, you know, yeah. intellectuals. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, it's a more complicated history. And the, the question, the, de- the economic development question is, is it possible that a country that's playing catch up with modernity needs to go through a period of more autocratic rules so they could just get stuff done? And then once they reach a certain level of general education, health, nutrition, wealth in the country, they can transition to a more liberal system, right? That's actually the pattern in Northeast Asia. Okay. And, and I, I guess following on from that, because I've heard, I've heard you talk about this before to do yeah. China potentially yeah. shifting to a more a liberal democratic system in the future. So if you, I mean, went, to, if you went to China 15 years ago and you yeah. talked to highly placed people, they were all anticipating... Mm-hmm more liberalization to come. Mm-hmm. So it was actually a shock to people when she took over. So right. people were shocked, like, like very senior people in the government and in business that I knew just openly predicted that, you know, they, things would continue liberalizing. There's no way they would ever get rid of, they, they actually put in a kind of term limit. They did the um, yeah. rule. Yeah. But then like, she kind of like got rid of it yeah. away. Right. But, but, 15 years ago, people would have bet like their house that, oh, that rule is it for good because they learned, they learned from Mao's excesses yeah. and people still remember that. So this rule is going to stick for at least another generation. They turned out to be wrong, but it doesn't mean intrinsically that, okay, after C dies, you couldn't have like a liberalizing period where like with Hu Jintao and these other guys, there was kind of like multiple people who were kind of in at the top and they were kind of sharing power. And everything was very laissez-faire in that period. Mm. For, for the Chinese and the communist mentality, that period, you know, had, there were a lot of negative things about that period, which like people who like Occupy Wall Street would agree with because pe- some people got very rich in China. Yeah. You know, there was crazy like prostitution and, and all kinds of bribery. Yeah, and there was a lot you of know, corruption. All kinds of, yeah. Tons of corruption. And so she actually came in saying, I'm going to, I got to, this is all got to tone. This all has to be put under control. Otherwise the communist party is going to lose authority. It's going to lose respect among the people. And so he came in to do that. Right. So, but it doesn't mean that 20 years from now, they couldn't be going through another big liberalizing phase after she is gone. Okay. And I suppose my, my question is, what, what, what do we mean when we talk about liberalization? Are we talking about like what South Korea did where it went essentially to a fully liberal democratic system? Or are we look so at you were, maybe it's something more like Singapore where it's kind of a, a combination of liberal democracy and with meritocratic so, elements. Yeah. So if you remember, there were widespread experiments with local voting 
15 years ago in China. So where they, they would actually let the local villages and maybe pro, like not province level, but county level officials be elected by the people. So you, you could, you could start with stuff like that, where, where there's really direct democracy at some yeah. grassroots level, or yeah. level, but then like the people then who then staff, like say the top few thousand people in the communist party, they then are representatives. They elect the next Xi or something. Right. So, so, you know, it could look something like that. In fact, if you talk to a lot of Chinese people, they'll actually, you know, when you, when you do these surveys, like Harvard will go and do these surveys and they, in different countries and they'll say like, okay, what, how, how democratic do you think your country is? A lot of people already think China is democratic because the average people think that their communist party representatives are more or less doing what they want. And those representatives are then electing the more senior, like central committee members and stuff. So, so the, there is a, a sense in which it's a very much more representative democracy than not direct democracy, but it is democracy. And a lot of, Ch I'm not saying I agree with this view, but, but a lot of Chinese people actually think of themselves as a democratic country because they actually don't take the worst view of the internal workings of the Communist Party. They take a more positive view of it. And okay. if you take the positive interpretation, it is a system of aggregating preferences of the ordinary people. Okay. So, so it does, it does faithfully represent the wishes of, you know, 80% of the time or whatever. It faithfully represents the wishes of the average people. That's the and, um, where, um, where, whereas, like, whereas one could argue in the U.S. that that, that isn't even true. Like mm. the, the average people here don't, like their preferences Definitely. are not actually reflected in the final policy. I guess one of the things I was asking is, do you think that China will retain many of the meritocratic elements that have helped it succeed succeed and i think that a way in which another country that's done something similar to that is singapore right singapore has a kind of hybrid system of yeah. meritocracy with liberal democratic elements could you see that kind of something similar to that emerging in china or are you, are you thinking something more like south korea where it's a more fully liberal system so i think people who are trying to understand countries in the greater sinosphere mm -hmm. i think which singapore and taiwan even, even you could say Korea and, and such, there's a deep layer of civilization and cultural heritage, yeah. which really Confucian. Yeah. And that is where the meritocratic tendencies come from. And, yeah. and I don't think they'll soon jettison that. So I, I think that's going to be more stable. The communist or not communist aspect <laughs> of things is more shallow and it, it can go away eventually. Right. Okay. So. So, you know, which is why you could have a system like, you know, it's literally the same people kind of like in running the Singapore government or running the Taiwan government or running the, the Beijing government. Right. So, yeah. so the, the communist versus not communist aspect by now is a little bit baked in because the communists can claim credit for modernizing China, bringing China back into the forefront among nations. So, so they, they have some social capital to spend and they won't just go away. Like, I don't think it's brittle. Like tomorrow we'd have a color revolution and the, the system <laughs> stopped the communists. I don't think that's at all likely to happen. But over longer periods of time, yes, absolutely. You, 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 I think you could end up with a much more Singapore-like system in China okay. than the... Well, and let me just add one more thing. If you read the writing of Deng Xiaoping and the writing of uh, Lee Kuan Yew, those people were in contact with each other. And yeah. Uh, yeah. it was actually Deng Xiaoping's visits to Singapore and Japan that caused the opening up of China and so even today, I was just in Singapore earlier this summer meeting with a bunch of government officials, mostly about AI and such. But of course, we talked about other things like geopolitics. And they regularly still to this day receive high level delegations of Chinese communist leaders who come to Singapore Very interesting. and meet with them to discuss, like, what can we learn from Singapore? What can the Singaporeans learn from the Chinese? That still happens to this day. And I, lots of interesting insights that I received okay. from, from those Singaporean officials came from, you know, extended contacts they've had with their counterparts, not just like one year visit, but they've known the same official now for 10, 15 years. Maybe they've even visited, you know, visited them, their families, maybe even know each other. So, wow, so okay. these are very deep yeah, level contacts. Deep ties. So like, yeah, so like for, for the, American guy, like, you know, Josh Hawley of Alabama or whatever, <laughs> like, just like, oh, these communists in their weird looking mouse suits, they don't really understand the West. Well, like, 
Josh Hawley maybe has never been to Singapore, but yeah. the communist guy may have spent an integrated like 10 yeah. weeks in Singapore, like learning from the Singaporean government, right? So, so it's, it's, it, 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 there's just such a disconnect with reality among, say, Washington elites. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'd read about the Deng's visits to Singapore and I'd read about the ties between the CPC and the PAP in Singapore, but I didn't, I didn't realize it ran that deep. Um, yeah. And uh, continues to this day. Yeah. And I guess another, another thing I wanted to talk about on the economy point to do with China is I've seen a lot of the more free market types and a lot of who often overlap with the U S hawks basically say that China's prosperity has very little to do with government policy. It's just to do with global market forces and the Chinese government letting them do their thing. It's all because they join the world trade organization. Obviously, that's an element of the fact that China's moved from a centrally planned economy to a market economy played a massive role in there, in the miracle. But what, what role did government policy actually play? Yeah. So government policy played a role in improving the education system and the university system so that they're now world-class, building high-speed rail, building yeah. lot yeah. infrastructure, and also deepening the core technology prowess. Yeah. of the Chinese economy. That, that isn't necessarily going to be done by companies. Companies have a, you know, at one extreme, a short range focus, which is like yeah. one quarter, or maybe like in an exceptional case, you could have a company that has a five-year time horizon or a three-year time horizon. Mm -hmm. That would be yeah. exceptional. But the government did things like invest in new technologies being developed over 10 years, right? So 20 years. So that, that, that and I think like people who really understand science and technological innovation, even in the U.S., would say like that is a huge, huge part of the American success. And yeah. we're very focused. I used to be the vice president for research at my university. People like me were very, very focused on the fact that basic research in the United States used to be above 1% of GDP and it's been declining. It's well below 1% of GDP. And that, that is the kind of stuff that delivers the most long-term ROI of anything. And so just having a country that's like just more optimistic about doing that rather than like letting it erode is a huge delta over 10, 20 year timescales. Yeah. And it's definitely because, and I know another thing that China, the Chinese government has played a criti critical role in is basically making sure that, because obviously companies, especially in an emerging market have the incent, the incentive is for short term, often speculative investment, right? Whereas China, obviously through targeted and conditional subsidies to manufacturing and to research and development really steered, didn't plan in place of the market, but steered the market towards a more long-term success, a more successful and conducive for development in the long term. Yeah. Now I would say to get to where it is now, China needed both like huge yeah. amount of market liberalization, you know, foreign capital, at least yes. in the past, they needed foreign capital. Now they don't need the foreign capital. They yeah. run a trillion dollar gold surplus. So, but, but they also needed this infrastructure build up, human capital yeah. investment, all that other stuff, which really only government can do. Now, I think it, to, the, the most, I think, positive thing I can say about the sort of far right free market people and the way they analyze the Chinese economy is they could still benefit from sh shrinking the state-owned enterprises. So, so state-owned enterprises okay. for them, just like in Scandinavia or other places, are a way to like park <laughs> stuff. Like, oh, we, we don't want the employment rate to go up or we don't want a bunch of people thrown out of work. Well, we'll just make sure the state-owned enterprises are still a big chunk of the economy and yeah. they don't let people off and they don't have to make profits. And so, so it's like you have two parts of the economy, one okay. which is growing at a free market rate and the other one which is sclerotic and not growing as fast because it's the state-owned enterprise sector. And I, I would say like, if one could wave a magic wand and decrease somewhat the size of a state-owned enterprise sector in China, that, that might be very beneficial to them. But it's not, it's, not, it's not something that as a single factor is going to be catastrophic for them. Yeah. 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 That's, that's very interesting. And I guess even with the private sector, you look at the private sector, that's obviously through particularly at the moment, support for research and development and technology, a massive amount of government involvement. And yeah, I guess, I mean, you said earlier through one area where the government has been very influential is through investment in technology. Is, is the way they've done that investment through the 
I guess, performance conditional subsidies. Is that the way it's been done? Yeah, it's it's so funny because the, the best analog of what the governments do in these local regions, provinces and cities is is venture capital. So they basically right. like, you know, they're giving money to companies, but they might stop giving you money if you're not performing. Yeah. Yeah. And and they're very numbers driven, KPI driven, you know, type things. If it works, it's it's a it's a, actually a very good model. It, you know, if it doesn't work, it's corrupt stuff and betting on the wrong things and et cetera. I, I actually kind of feel like because the US system has become so kind of hollowed out and it's just dominated by grifters. That yeah. most of what, when, the, like, I'm for, if you say, like, just directionally, are you for rebuilding American manufacturing and infrastructure and all these things? I, I, of course, I'm for that. I'm very yeah. enthusiastically for that. But when you ask me, like, what are the odds the Americans can actually execute yeah. the fund once the money is allocated? Exactly, yeah. I would say low. I would say low. It's going to just be grifting and special interests. And, and a lot of Americans don't want to work that hard. So, so. Yeah, I just, I, I'm not optimistic that we can execute on things like this. I am, um, I guess, broadening to the wider um, geopolitical situation. Do you think that China's rise in high-tech manufacturing has been aided by essentially the U.S. instigating a decline in Germany's um, high-tech <laughs> manufacturing sector with the Russia sanctions? Yeah, well, I think that particular aspect of Okay, Russia sanctions and blowing up of their pipeline. pipeline, <laughs> yeah. pipeline. You know, you have sky high energy prices in Germany. Yeah. You crippled large portions of their manufacturing industry. Yeah. Again, elite consensus in the United States doesn't understand this point, but uh, I think the Germans, at least the Germans I was with in Frankfurt, understand this point, right? Yeah. So the German companies are all deciding: Oh, am I going to relocate to America or to China? Because yeah. they need to go somewhere, right? Yeah. And, and you know, the U.S. will actually benefit. It's a little bit like as the empire declines, we start sucking the resources back into the core. So yeah. America will actually benefit from some of these German companies moving their manufacturing, you know, or the chemical companies moving their production mm -hmm. to the U.S. But some of it's also already moved to China, like BASF. So, so. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, it was not a smart move. I mean, we're basically crippling Europe. Europeans are yeah. more or less kind of politically enslaved by us. So they, they don't, can't really fight it. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it is beneficial both to America and the, and the Chinese. Yeah. I can, I can attest to the fact that Europe's being economically crippled as I live here, uh, yeah. even though I'm not in well, the I'll EU. Tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. I was talking to one of my, this guy was a PhD student of mine. And then we, we co-founded a tech company 20 years ago and we keep in touch. And he, he speaks German. Okay. He's German on his mother's side and he's traveled extensively in Germany over the years. In fact, he happened to be there when the wall fell. A long right. Time. Well, okay. But so anyway, we were talking about Germany and we were talking about the cost of living and how much money people in Germany actually make. And if you actually look like in The Economist or something, you'll see like Germans are about as rich. They're slightly less rich than people in Mississippi in the United States. Yeah. Right. If, if Germany was a state in the United States, it would be below Mississippi in terms of its, you know, income per capita, et cetera. And if you sell this to a proud German, they get really mad and they'll say, yeah, but I don't have to pay for college here, you know, and our, my health care, blah, blah, blah. But most people in even in rich cities like Munich or Frankfurt, they're living on 2000 euros net, maybe 3000 euros net per month. That's that's actually a reasonable like mm -hmm. income for them. And if you think about that in American terms, it's not very much money. And these are like professional, educated people, not not like working class people. Right. So so the Europe in some ways compared to America, you're starting to realize like it it is poor. And yeah. and like I have I have friends in London who joke that like the UK is going to become the best outsourcing destination for English language work because the English <laughs> English is very good. <laughs> yeah. And OG English. And, but the costs are pretty low compared to what you have to pay an American worker. So it's, it's unfortunate. And I've heard the UK described, because obviously that's where I am. I've heard it described perhaps hyperbolically as London with a Bulgaria staple to it. Um, yeah, basically that. That captures it. Yeah. 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 And I guess, yeah, staying on the topic of, of, because we touched on Russia and Ukraine and returning to China, I mean, do you observe a Sino-Russian alliance to be building 
Or do you think that would be an oversimplification of the relations between no, the two countries? Definitely. I think there's definitely an alliance building. And again, like like people I would consider pretty midwit geostrategists would say, oh, it's going to fall apart because, and then they say things like, oh, they're going to fight about Central Asia, these Central Asian republics that used to be part of the Soviet Union, and China wants to take them over or something. And or they'll say like, oh, no, they have this huge border and China is going to try to take China one Siberia. <laughs> yeah. When in fact, like China has these terrible demographic problems where they can't even get Chinese people to live in the northeast of China because, yeah, yeah. yeah so like how many of them, how many Chinese people are you going to be able to get to move to Vladivostok? Right. So, <laughs> so I just don't see in the short run. Now, in the long run, there could be a situation where Russia weakens a lot and China does actually take back some of that territory. But I would say that's probably generations away or at least one generation. Yeah. But in the in the 10 year time scale, 20 year time scale, I see them as tight allies because yeah. if you're Russian and you know, you're watching Russian TV and you're like, oh yeah, a bunch of people in Kursk were just killed by NATO weapon systems. Yes. Right. And and, you know, like we're fighting for our lot, like, oh, a battleship, you know, a, a, a frigate was just sunk in the Black Sea by a missile that was shipped to, uh, you know, the Ukrainians from Germany or from the UK, right? Britain, yeah, yeah. Really? Are, are, are you going to forget that? Like maybe your cousin, yeah, yeah. maybe your cousin was on that ship. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, and when, and I don't believe the casualty figures that NATO midwits, you know, bandy about in this conflict yeah. for Russia, like. But still, probably a lot of Russians have been killed, like oh, as yeah, many, definitely. certainly as many as like Americans were killed in the Vietnam War. OK, mm -hmm. and at like 50,000 maybe could easily. And so, yeah. and so they're not going to forget, like it's crazy anti-Russian kind of racism to say like, oh, they're just going to forget that we imposed that many casualties on their exactly, young men. Exactly, because they and think like, that... They'll, they'll they think just, the Russians think about like their people in terms of a horde or whatever. That's like they they genuinely think that's how Russians think. Yeah, definitely not. And they're not going to pivot. Not, suddenly, and they're not going to suddenly pivot and say, "Oh, now we want to be part of NATO and Western Europe and and system." You know, after you caused so many of our people, and they actually, I think, feel bad about the Ukrainians that died, even though we don't feel bad about the Ukrainians that yeah. died. The Russians actually probably do to some extent feel bad. And so, because they view them as their kind of Mac brothers. Cousins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's just a total misunderstanding of the si geopolitical situation here. So exactly. I, 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 so anyway, you're basically integrating Russia into the Sinosphere right, right now. Yeah, yeah. The, the Chinese economy, like all the, you know, advanced manufactured goods that they have in Russia are now coming to them from China. So. The sanctions are working well. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, it's just, it's just ridiculous to see these, as you say, like NATO, like midwit commentators, just always predicting the worst possible outcome for Russia and China and always predicting the best possible outcome for yeah. the US and its bloc. What's bizarre is that like, even when these guys are like actually military guys, like yeah. actual, you know, they, they, I don't think they've ever like counted like how many actual operable tanks and jet fighters does nato have exactly yeah like or, or could could like britain field one division on the continent <laughs> the answers are uh, to all those things are like no no yeah like they, i it, they're like a little chihuahua barking like crazy Pretty like much. only thing they have really going for them is nuclear weapons Nukes, yeah. Like, like yeah so if it yeah. wasn't for those nuclear weapons they would be you know they would be as helpless as you know you know argentina or something right yeah. so and it's, uh, I, I know another thing that's going on in America at the moment is that they're essentially forgetting how to build certain things, um, yes. certain, certain defense technologies. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's going to be a big problem for them going forward. So I think, I think on that note, we'll wrap up this podcast. It's been brilliant talking to you, Steve. Some fantastic insights about China, about geopolitics generally. And thank you so much for coming on the show. It was my pleasure. And, you know, I, I thank you for really asking the right questions. I, I think we went into more depth into a lot of these in a lot of these topics than I normally can go, because normally I'm assuming my interlocutor or the audience isn't really that sophisticated. But in your case, I think you're you're you pretty are you are pretty sophisticated about these <laughs> matters. We could have a much better conversation. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I hope to have you on the podcast again relatively soon.
Fantastic. I'd love to come back.